Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to India, Richard Varma. Ambassador Varma, appreciate you joining Thank us you. here on CNBC TV 18. I'm going to start by quoting you back to you. You've said that this is a year of consequence for India and the U.S. and a year of transformation as well. What would you base your assessment on? What are the parameters that you use to judge that? When we look at all the major categories of cooperation between the U.S. and India, whether it's in the defense arena or clean energy or economics and trade or all the other categories, what we saw in, in 2015 and 2014 is that we exceeded or broke every record in all of those categories. So two-way trade numbers were the highest ever, uh, the number of visitors to the United States, the highest ever, 1.2 million, uh, the number of students studying in the United States, the highest ever. So we've really deepened and expanded our cooperation in, in so many areas. You know, over the course of our two histories, we've pursued these independent tracks, independent economic tracks, independent security tracks. And what we've seen over the last decade, mm. but really over the last two years in particular, is that the two tracks have started to converge uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. And is that largely to do with the chemistry between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi? Look, I think that's a big part of it, and I think they both have put a lot into the relationship. The President called this one of his top foreign policy priorities. I think there's more to it than that, though. We obviously have shared values. Well, we but we had the shared values, you know, a decade ago right. as well. I think there is now an acknowledgement that we need each other. We need each other economically to help power the economic growth globally. We need each other as trading partners. We need each other from a security perspective to help stabilize parts of Asia and South Asia and to be uh, partners in counterterrorism cooperation. We need each other to bring the latest uh, solutions in clean energy and civil nuclear energy to the population mm. uh, that currently doesn't have it. We need each other uh, from a science and innovation point of view to continue to uh, be the world's best innovators. Mm. How driven is this also by the U.S.'s effort or need to rebalance the power equation in Asia? Uh, I mean, you know, there's no secret about China and the dominance that China has had uh, on the global economic front, especially when it comes to trading ties with the U.S. I think what you've seen is a convergence. We, as you say, we've had a rebalance to Asia uh, for the last three or four years now, uh, two-thirds of our Navy will be in, in Asia. We're shifting to where the people, the trade, and the economics is taking place in the future, and, and that's a reasonable focus for us. Uh, at the same time, India has its Act East policy. Mm. Those two uh, intersections are coming into great convergence, and we're finding cooperation across the Asia-Pacific. Who would have thought it possible that the U.S. and India would enter into a joint vision statement for the Asia-Pacific mm -hmm. where we agreed to deepen our trade and economic relationships, uh, uphold the rule of law, uh, cooperate uh, militarily and from a maritime perspective in a way that we never have before. So I think there's great intersection. What I would say mm -hmm. is that this cooperation is not directed at any third country, certainly not directed at China. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We both have very complicated uh, economic interdependence mm -hmm. with China, uh, we have robust engagement with China, when we have security concerns with China we talk about them, when we have human rights concerns with China we talk about them, but the U.S.-India relationship very much stands on its own. So let me ask you about specifics now on how we can engage uh, and sort of move forward and achieve the sort of targets that we've set out for ourselves. The roadmap for that $500 billion bilateral trade target, we're nowhere close to it. Uh, what do you see as, as the, the next milestone in being able to get to that number? Sure. I actually think we're closer to it than, 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 we people, think? than people would expect. The reason I say that is because Right now, only about 2% of U.S. exports come to India, mm -hmm. and only about 2% of India's exports go to the United States. Yep. So given the size of our respective economies, even if we were to increase uh, that, those numbers even uh, slightly, we would make a big dent in that two-way trade number. There is a lot of interest in India. It's not just interest. Mm. We're starting to see investment decisions taken. But, but they, are, they are watching what happens on the reform front, both in Delhi. They're watching what happens mm. at individual state levels. I think they've, they've seen a very good trajectory. Uh, and as we continue to bring down those barriers to entry, 
uh, and again, in both directions, then I think that number will, will increasingly head towards that $500 billion target that our President and Prime Minister have set. What do you think is holding back the investment decision today? Because you said, obviously, uh, reforms and the agenda for reforms is one thing, but the actual implementation on the ground is another. Do they continue to be concerned about the pace of change at this point in time? I think uh, there have been concerns over, over many years, and we can go through some of those indicators. Uh, you know that are under the ease of doing business umbrella you know and I will say there has been good progress when I look at just at the tax category mm. for example you know uh, tax fairness and tax certainty was certainly one of the number one issues that kept coming up the fact that we've entered into advanced transfer pricing mm -hmm. agreements uh, the fact that we've settled a hundred old tax cases that there are a hundred to go the fact that the government has taken off the issue of retro taken off the table retroactive taxation all those help uh, bring the issue of, of tax fairness and tax certainty into into better so you're saying it's no longer the number one concern tax fairness and tax certainty is no longer the number one concern when I, it comes to US investors looking at India I'm saying uh, it's been tackled in a way that perhaps it hasn't been tackled in the past and that we're having excellent government-to-government -government conversations. And to the extent there are lingering cases and, and lingering, um, you know, uh, old tax cases that need to be solved, mm -hmm. we need to do that to get more confidence into the system. But it's not just tax. It's contract sanctity mm -hmm. and legal certainty. I think the development of commercial courts will really help in, in this regard. It's regulatory burden. Uh, again, when you look at what the states are doing, mm. let's say, for example, on a single uh, regulatory licensing window, I think that sort of reform will really help. In 2005, there were only about 200 U.S. companies mm -hmm. operating here in India. That number is well over uh, 500 companies now and employing some several million Indian workers. A big part of my job is to make sure we're attracting investment in the to United the US, States yes. as well. And what we've seen there is, is dramatic as well. And we've gone from 50 Indian companies uh, a few years ago to well over 200. Since you're talking about Indians investing in the U.S., I'm sure you have had conversations with Indian IT companies who are not particularly happy at this point in time. So let me ask you to comment on that. NASCOM has put out a, a number saying that Indian IT companies would be hit with about a $400 million charge on account of the latest visa fee hikes. The totalization agreement hasn't gone anywhere, despite the fact that both sides have been trying to uh, sort of converge on, on this issue. A, is there any hope that we are going to see any progress as far as the totalization agreement is concerned? And B, on the visa hike specifically, uh, you know, is there, is there any recourse for Indian companies? For the first time in 2015, we entered into a discussion with the Indian government on totalization. Our Social Security Administration with their Indian counterparts had two really constructive meetings. Let's see where, where they can take it, but I know the President is committed to having a really uh, a robust dialogue on this subject. Okay. On the H-1B and L-1 visa mm -hmm. fees, I also think you know that India gets somewhat like 70% of all H-1B sure. visas issued. I also understand the concern about the increase in fee that went from uh, 2000 to 4000 2500 to 4500 in the case of the L-1s. I also know that there is a, a conversation going on with members of Congress about the fee. Let's see where that goes. I think people should also know what the fee increase was for. Hmm. It was in a budget bill that was a $2 yep. trillion dollar budget right. bill. Uh, provision that was designed to raise money for the victims' families mm -hmm. uh, from 9-11.